Hi everybody, Steve from Steve's Makerspace and today we've got something special for you. Uh, Mark Simmons has graciously agreed to join me today to talk about GameCraft. Uh, <laughs> Mar Mark is the CEO, co-founder, and game director at Free Jam, the company that is currently working on GameCraft. And Free Jam also made Card Life and is best known for RoboCraft, a wildly successful PvP BattleBot building game released in 2013. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining. I did what you say. Oh, look at that. Very good. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, Mark. Um, so, uh, how are you getting on? How are you getting on with the uh, the state in the house? Uh, the it's uh, it's going okay. I'm I'm doing all right. I'm a little worried about my kids. I got two kids, so I worry about them being isolated from their friends. And we're we're yeah. Trying I, I my son said he's starting to get bored and he preferred being at school. And that's just kicked in. We've only been doing it a week now. So. No, we're at, in week three, I guess. Uh, yeah, so starting week three now. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm finding it quite challenging. I think the other guys at Free Jam that have children are finding it quite challenging to juggle trying to work and homeschool children having them around the home at the same time i think that's quite difficult mm -hmm. interrupting your work and stuff you know. yeah and obviously you you, you kind of you, while you're working you feel like you're leaving the children on their own and and you feel this responsibility to interact with them enrich their lives and then when you're doing that you're feeling like the game's not making progress. I really should be working. So, like, it's it's a, a tension in your mind that's always there. Yes, yes, and I have uh, struggling with some uh, the weight of responsibility uh, to keep up their mental health. Um, yeah. In in this thing, so, who heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, but. Uh, but people need the entertainment and uh, of of the sort of thing that y you and I do, and um, to take their minds off <laughs> the COVID. And also, um, you know, your game is is so creative. Uh, it has such potential for creativity to express yourself and to, you know. Um, I don't know to to do things purposefully instead of just uh, binge watching Netflix. It's yeah, I, I hope as well. Uh, like with GameCraft, we we're hoping that that we can instill a bit of collaboration in the community between people who have different skills, and I think that's quite valuable during this time. And uh, obviously, I, I hope to demonstrate, or we hope at free jam to demonstrate with gamecraft that has educational value as well long term oh yeah what do you think um people would use it for in education well it, even the idea of making games often touches on education a lot of the time i hear friends who do various jobs that aren't video games and they'll say stuff like, well, I learned all that trigonometry at school. What did I learn that for? I never, I've never, ever used it since school. Mm. And I always think, well, I use that kind of stuff every day, you know. Mm. So, uh, you know, all of that, that kind of triangle stuff, the physics stuff, obviously. We do a load of math. Uh, so a, an awful lot of stuff we're using in games. I mean, we do copywriting. So you're, you're using English skills quite a lot. Mm. Um obviously arts involved and so it's a whole kind of mixed bag of skills so i think it's quite educational and obviously where children are often into playing games hopefully for them g learning just by playing with game craft not realizing necessarily they're learning at the same mm -hmm. time um you know when you're trying to create a game you're setting up you know rules and logic and a bit of math and stuff like that and you're thinking you're having to plan it and perhaps you're putting a story in there or something like that and all those elements 
you know, they're creative, creative elements, but they're, they're kind of touching on all the things you're learning at school. Yeah, project management. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how to, what's my end goal and, and who is my uh, audience and how do I, uh, what, what are those elements I'm going to put in there to keep it engaging and um, all those gaming elements. Uh, how many people are working at FreeJam right now? So you have 10 developers, and they're all dedicated to GameCraft. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we've just gotten past the point where we've got some major kind of infrastructural things in place. So our core underlying technology for the multiplayer, we figured out, even though the multiplayer itself doesn't demonstrate that yet. Mm. And the... Uh, things like the wiring system and the underhood method that you would wire both single player and multiplayer games i feel like we've got that quite figured out even though the ux and the way you interact with the wires could do with some improvement and polish so i feel like we're starting to get to the point where we're starting to make more rapid progress now and we can begin to introduce blocks more quickly that introduce uh, more powerful features that actually can inject some real fun into the games and the creations that people make hopefully we'll see that with this release where we're introducing the generic physics blocks so you know these are just kind of raw blocks that you know give you a chance to kind of just do random stuff with whatever you can think and i hope to they will really shine with this update um mm -hmm. so i think we're, we're going to be able to put more of that in faster now um literally just started thinking about and we'll have the guys begin to work on next week next sprint so that is after this release uh they will begin to work on features such as the character being able to lose health and die and respawn <laughs> and, and then we have to think about okay how does he how does he actually get damaged and then you start to think about okay there's falling damage and being hit by big boulders and being squashed between pistons and things like that but there's also um you know l laser projectiles and and laser beams and volumes that can damage you and and all of these things you would expect to find in gameplay and then on top then we've begun to think about how you could get ai into the mix and have ai drive machines that you build mm. and and the machines that you build can have these laser projectile launches on. And all of a sudden, you've got games that, you know, can include quite fun gameplay where your character can die from robots that are controlled by AI that have lasers on. And, and then we'll put guns into the hands of the character so you can shoot back. Oh, man. Uh, um, and, you know, if you want to drive a little vehicle which has guns on it and control that, you can too. And and put all that in the hands of the game crafters so hopefully we're starting to get to the fun stage now you know yeah wow that's awesome yeah I, it seems to me like building a house you have to have a firm foundation and then there there's a framework that goes up and then you can start putting the drywall on um and it's like you're you're at the drywall stage now i think <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's true yeah, we're starting the we'll start to get, get, put the put the paint in the hands of the paintbrush in the hands of the game crafters soon, you know. That's right. Yeah. Give them some furniture. Uh huh. Uh, <laughs> and um, what's how do you decide like what to do next in a game when you're building it for for people who aren't familiar with game development? What's what are the stages involved? um well i think it starts with we follow we follow a methodology called the lean the lean startup which was a methodology developed in silicon valley um for these kind of web startups that were prevalent in silicon valley um eric and Reel's book yeah yeah eric Reel's book. that's it and and it hadn't been applied to video games and we kind of read through the, the the theory and felt that actually it could apply really well to video games 
in particular if you're trying to be fairly innovative with your game and if you're fairly small because i think there's the triple a approach obviously where you're blizzard and you're going to spend 100 million and you're going to make this game and the quality and quantity of that game is so great that it will succeed with brute force uh, um and we can never compete with that with 10 people we we can't match them for quality and quantity mm. So all we can do is try to be a bit maverick and try to innovate in areas that maybe that uh, Blizzard wouldn't attempt to touch mm. um, in the hope that we may get lucky and, and get an audience for our work. And um, with the Lean Starter, it allows us to kind of try an idea, have a hypothesis for a game, and then create like a small version of that game, which has uh, a few elements that represent the core idea. In this case, if we allow people to make games with blocks, can we get people to make games with blocks? Will they enjoy making games with blocks? Will they make games with blocks that are actually fun for other people to just play? You know, mm -hmm. even those players that don't want to create games so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is why we this is the whole reason we kind of release it in such a rough and ready form so early so that we could try to prove out whether the ideas are sound and the key thing here is to fail fast i mean if it is if it sucks as an idea mm. and nobody likes it then it's better not to waste uh, millions of pounds making it right and yeah. um, we can say we can save everybody the pain of uh, <laughs> developing it, launching it, and then having it fail. So yeah. that's the kind of basic idea. Yeah, I love that. And um, it seems it, it, it's a, a good example, I think, of doing creative things as well as, you know, starting your business. Um, just we have um, all these creators in GameCraft and... Um, the more things you try, the more success you have. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you have an idea for creating something, and maybe it won't be successful. Maybe you won't be able to pull it off. But you can, um, uh, instead of like planning something in isolation for a long period of time, you just do something as quickly as you can, put it out there, and you can get feedback from other players or other people. It's uh, absolutely critical. I think in the case where the game enables players to create things, um, to get feedback from those players very early is so important to us. Now, one specific example was the time that you spoke to me on Discord and you said, Here's a thing I do. I'd like to do. It was it was to create pixels, um, and you wanted to copy create a row of pixels. Then you wanted to copy and paste that row, so you could create a whole TV screen of pixels. And you you posed the question: How would I do this with the mouse scrolling based ID system that we had for wiring things before? Mm. And um, it made me think. Uh, much further ahead than I would have otherwise done at that point, that question you posed. And that, at that point, that's the point. I took a whole step back and I said, we, we, we sat with the guys and we kind of figured out the current wiring system and it made us conclude we needed multiple inputs, multiple outputs on a single block. Mm. And we needed to support, support multiple stats on a block and come up with an interface for wiring that up. And uh, obviously, then we, we took a pause and then we developed the current wiring system, which, you know, it still needs improvement, in particular, the way that you interact with it. Mm -hmm. But I think the core concept is quite solid. So I believe we'll get into a place where it feels much slicker to use, yeah, but still still has all the power that it has under the hood right now. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. I'm. You know, when I first started playing the game, I was thinking of it as like another scrap mechanic or uh, um, besiege or um, these other 
physics-based games, and and I didn't really understand why you were pushing players to do make games. I was like, I don't want to make a game. I want to just make this gadget. Um, yeah. But now that you're coming out with these new blocks in this next update, I'm like, oh, I'm starting to see the potential for game making. And I'm like, okay, this is different. This isn't another scrap mechanic. This is something completely different. Um, it's, I don't know if you can compare it to like RPG Maker or um, Roblox. Um, is this... I think well, I think one important like we thought we the first thing to say is when we started at Free Jam, we had uh, we we had just finished working on a product with uh, Disney, and it was a game called Cubotics, okay. and it was it was very much like Besieged and Scrap Mechanic. But this was back in 2012. I mean, it was it was that was at the end of a, like a a few years we'd been working on it. So we've been working on it a long time back then. And Disney had some a round of canning a few projects, and we were one of those projects that got canned. They didn't see how it fit with Disney's brand. So we, so our project got canned. It happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we still felt that we had something very special, so we kind of paused and said, "Well, what can we do with this, these blocks, this physics stuff we've got?" And we kind of went, "Okay, well, let's make it multiplayer. Let's add guns and let's just get people f fighting each other's creations." And that turned into Robocraft. Mm -hmm. But we kind of never lost this passion back then for just sandbox just creativity just uh letting users make stuff for each other and it was one of the big drivers for free jam that one of the reasons for the name is not about free games it's about freedom to jam together mm. jamming as in the band sense jamming yes and um and we were all about we thought, what, how can we make a huge game, but with just five of us? And, and we, we, we decided we wanted to pick games that had a small chance, even if it was microscopically small, a small chance to go absolutely big and ballistic with just five of us. Mm -hmm. And that is when we kind of latched on to user-generated content because it seems like an, a good way to grow a game much bigger than developers could ever make themselves by harnessing the power of the community to make things for each other to to in, enjoy right mm -hmm. and uh and robocraft was our first attempt at that and it had a very limited amount of uh community creating things for each other but it also did succeed partly because people made crazy creations and fought each other mm. Card Life itself as a game started out simply as this idea as, of a way to let players create 3D models. And then I, this was an idea. How do you let, how do you let 10 year old kids model things in 3D? Because 3D modeling is quite complicated, right? Guys study it using Blender or Maya. For years and years and years, doing Boolean operations and extruding and things like that, mm -hmm. it's really complicated. And so we we developed uh, an interface for drawing 3D space, 3D shapes by just drawing 2D shapes in the sky. Mm -hmm. And this would, and we came up with this really nice modeling technique for drawing shapes in the sky with 2D shapes. Um, and it would form a 3D shape. But it was very weird. It was very arbitrary. And we were like, how do you make this actually make sense to a kid? I mean, what, what, what's the game that can come out of this? And all of a sudden it was like, well, you know, it's like cutting cardboard. It's, it's you know, you're, you're literally just drawing a shape. You're cutting out pieces of cardboard. And Card Life initially was this system where you could draw pieces of cardboard and cut them and color them and put pictures on the side of them and cut them out and... and Eventually, we hired some people on board to help us develop that idea, and they ran with the idea, and they wanted to develop it into a survival game. Uh, 
but that wasn't kind of where the the essence of the card life idea was born it was born out of this idea of trying to empower users to be creative and give them a new way to create stuff yeah it was very and, very different than anything that had ever been made before to just yeah make a sword that looks you know however you want the sword to look it's pretty i think ultimately the idea of making a survival game suffers issues where you you have to ask yourself what does cardboard itself bring to the survival game genre a, apart from an aesthetic mm. um and Possibly we made a mistake there to to attempt to make a survival game out of cardboard rather than exposing its creative properties more. Mm. So with GameCraft, we, we this is kind of this is a thread of us learning things through our whole journey. You see, uh-huh. so with game with GameCraft, we're kind of saying, what's the ultimate spe- expression of creativity? Because you know scrap mechanic and besiege and those games already exist they already do incredible things with physics so what's the point of just doing uh, another sandbox physics games these these games are amazing games that you know they're very Mm. powerful fun sandbox tools right so for us is we were kind of going okay what's the ultimate expression of creativity and that's games they're interactive movies stories pieces of fun sometimes multiplayer sometimes single player so they're sometimes only just about describable as games they're just things right they're, they're kind of just fun yeah um and so then we set about okay how, let's make a product which enables people to make games but again you want to come back to the idea for us is like how do we lower the barrier to entry how do we make everybody able to make games mm-hmm. and that and that's for us where the blocks coming it's like digital lego it's like kids learn how to play lego nowadays they learn how to play minecraft too and um it, it maybe we can link together this idea of building games and doing it with blocks mm-hmm. so that's the kind of idea forming whether it's a good idea what time will tell yeah <laughs> but there's the kind of basic idea behind it and one of our ultimate goals is we've always had this concept of a graph um and at the top on one axis of the graph is how how much creative freedom you have to make anything you can possibly imagine okay and the other axis of the graph is how complicated it is to access that creative freedom Mm. and our ultimate goal is maximum creative freedom with minimum complexity yeah. and there's all there's a tension between the two constantly the other thing is there's this we have this idea that there's a kind of journey the player starts at the beginning and aspires to be right now paprika perhaps he's making the most complicated games right yeah. and um and so you've got like a the guy's the new users come in and they play the games and they start small and they just put simple blocks together. Like they stick a mover on the floor and start time and the mover just flies off on its own. And they just make a game with that basic block and that idea. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they get engaged in the product and then they go on this journey, gradually learning by playing the game. Mm -hmm. Um, And they aspire to, to be, um, access the creative freedom that some of the others in the community are at, are adding so the key th- the other key concept we have is this concept of there's this journey you go on from the start of the graph which is at the bottom no creativity but very low complexity up to the top of the graph which is maximum freedom higher complexity complexity but ideally low and we want to smooth that graph. So the journey from the start to the end is dead smooth for the player. So the complexity can gradually increase and they can just play with things and learn more as they go. Hmm. Maybe one small example is something we try to do here, which maybe hasn't worked that well, but it's just g- it give you an idea of the thinking behind it. Okay. So you, have, you know you have those little blue buttons that get in the way when you're trying to build. Okay, yeah. 
And some of the more experienced users, they want to turn it off. They want a tool so that they want to be in wire mode and the blue buttons are there and then they want to be in block building mode. And we have this tension between the, the ability to uh, do the wiring efficiently and the other side is the ability for new users to come in and discover by accident how to wire things. Mm. And the blue dot is there to kind of a new user starts the game, he goes, what's this blue dot? I don't really know what it is. I'll try clicking it and see what happens. And this thing in expands and it says there's an output to a button. Maybe I'll click that little red dot. And now they see there's a wire coming off of the little red dot. And they go, okay, where am I going to put this wire? <laughs> uh, and there's a kind of discover discoverability angle there. Probably in this case... At the moment, it's a bit too clunky and it does get in the way and it's frustrating. But it's the, the kind of ideas behind the the madness that you see maybe in the game sometimes. I'm going to wrap it up here because this interview went over an hour. And so I'm breaking it up into three videos. The next video is going to be Mark responding to critics of Robocraft and uh, where Robocraft went to. The third video is going to be... Uh, a deeper dive into features coming up in GameCraft and also um, an inside look at some team meetings. If you want to make sure you see those videos, subscribe and hit the bell so you get notifications. Uh, like this if you did. Let me and Mark know what you think of the interview in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. Steve's Makerspace.